Hi everyone, uh, my name is Helen Harimbi. Welcome to Imbali Live. Imbali started out as a podcast because we wanted to give key players in South African music their flowers while they can still smell them. And now we are a live event, so thank you very much for coming. Um, today's guest is somebody I'm super excited to be talking to. Um, bless me. She is a firebrand, a filmmaker, and a phenomenal force to be reckoned with in the music industry. Please put your hands together for Simpio Edana. How are you doing today? Uh, could be better. Could be better? Yeah. Okay, we're going to try and make today good <laughs> for you. So, you you're welcome. Please, let's start with your early days as a, as a youngin in the Eastern Cape. You grew up in Lusikisiki, right? Uh, actually, I grew up in different areas of the Eastern Cape. I, I moved around a lot. I yeah. stayed in Lusikisiki. I stayed in Flagstaff. I stayed in Kutzolo. I yeah. stayed in Tata. Why were you moving around so much? Um, well, my mom was a student nurse at some point. And during that time, actually, I stayed in Butterworth with my grandparents because she couldn't stay with us. She yeah. didn't have a place to stay. Um, and then once she had finished her studies, she kept being moved around to the different hospitals. So yeah. we then moved with her. Okay. And what part did music play in your life at that time? I, I think my earliest acquaintance with music is when I stayed in Butterworth with my grandparents. Um, because there'd be lots of um, um, events or ceremonies happening in the in the in the village, yeah. And those days, kids could still run around and not worry about their safety. So we used to attend all of this, like the weddings and um, the circumcision ceremonies, and etc. Yeah. Excuse me. So that that was really my earliest acquaintance with music. And then also, my grandparents used to go to church every Sunday, so I would also get that. Yeah. Yeah. And were you like, you know, every time you hear these stories of these musicians that become huge, they always say, I started in the church. And <laughs> what we know is that your father was a preacher, but were you somebody who started in the church? I started in the church, yes, and in the school choir. Um, so I basically sang in all of the different groups in the school choir, your quartet, your duet, you know, the big choirs. I, I sang in all of those. And then when, run about when I was 12, I would sometimes be allowed to lead the church um, choir oh, as wow. well. So I started quite young uh, with this music. But that was a huge responsibility, you know? Like, now you must lead the entire choir in front of the whole church. Well, I actually quite enjoyed it, mm. to be quite... I, I really loved music from when I was really, really small. I was that girl who... Because my mom is the one who inspired my singing. My, my mom used to be like the best singer in the trans guy. Yeah. Then one of the best. And I, she had a very sweet and small voice and I had this big voice and I wanted <laughs> to sound like her. So you'd, you'd hear me belting it out in the bathroom, holding it to tooth, toothbrush. <laughs> toothbrush and yeah. pretending it's a mic. Um, so I always had these visions of, of wanting to be a singer, but I thought it was a very far-fetched um, dream. Mm. Um, be it that I was in the village and I was like one of the poorest, in one of the poorest neighborhoods uh, around. And I never really thought that I would ever make it to Joburg yeah. and, and, and be a singer. Okay. I don't usually do this, but I think I'm going to ask us to swap because I feel like these oh, guys yes, here okay. don't see you. Not Is that okay? okay? That's fine. Okay. Is that better for you guys? Yes. Sorry, I'm guys. See me and you. <laughs> I've got you. I've got you. Um, so then you are busy leading the church choir. You want to be a musician, but you don't feel like it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. What's the thing that then leads you to think, maybe let me get into IT? Well, I was the firstborn at home and my mother more or less was a single parent. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I always, I don't know, because maybe I read a lot when I was small. I was very worldly and I knew that there were lots of possibilities, yeah. but I would have to carry myself. Um, and I knew that if I studied hard enough, I could do 
you know, I could choose any profession. And therefore, it wasn't necessarily a matter of me choosing IT because I liked IT. It was Y2K, like I was guaranteed a job. <laughs> yeah. I was guaranteed a job if I did IT. And for me, it was an easy choice to make. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I did get a bursary and I was guaranteed a job. As soon as I finished studying, I mean, halfway through my third year, I already had a job. I was working yeah. in any chance that I got. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this was when you were at Vids. Well, at first I was in PE, then I moved to VITS. I I moved to VITS because I actually got convinced by some friends of mine here that there was no ways I would make it in music if I stayed in PE. So I had to uproot myself and and come to Joburg. And once you got to Joburg, you started getting involved in this thing called... Uh, Blues Mondays, is it? Or Monday, Monday Blues. Blues. And there were lots of poetic Tuesdays as well. And then on Wednesdays, there was that place on Louis Borta. And then Thursdays, there were basically every, even Black Sunday. So every yeah. day of the week, was at the time day. that I came, I was in Joburg, I had moved to Joburg. There was always something happening that would help artists groom themselves and, and become better, you know? Yeah. And that's where I started singing. And, you know, I'd, I'd write a quarter of a song and go and sing it there and get a singing ovation and feel like, yeah. <laughs> I'm accomplished, you know, so I'm I'm feeling um, encouraged to go and, and write some more. You know, yeah. open mic sessions, like, there were quite a few of them, like with Abu Lebu Mashile and then Nabo Shagasi Sulu back in the day. Yeah. It was very vibey then. I don't know what happened now. Yeah. <laughs> but when we first started out, it was really very vibey and very encouraging to the young artists. Do you remember the first quarter of a verse that you went and performed in public? The one that got you a, a, a standing ovation? Well, the first time I got on stage, um, I actually sang a Jill Scott song. Oh, really? Yeah. Which one? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come, um, please. come, please, I really dig your company. So I sang that song and I, and I ended up on TV. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. On what? On the show, Melanie Bala and... Uh, Studio Mix? Yes, yeah, Studio Mix. Do you guys know Studio Mix? <laughs> am, I, am I aging you guys? <laughs> it was before your time, most of you. <laughs> okay. So then when you used to go to Abo Monday Blues and all the other days of mm. the weeks, you were performing your original material. Yes. And then I started writing and I was very challenged, like writing as cross and it. Mm. And I think it, it really had to do with like self-esteem issues and it's something that I, it really, really challenged me for a long time. And then I told myself, but there's no ways I'm a village girl and I'm not going to write in this course because like, yeah. it comes so naturally to me. But I think also socialization, you know, like being told that you know, you're in your culture less, it also played a role. So one of my first songs that I wrote was an English song. It's a, I got nothing. But then I got something, unlike Moses, I made it through the promised land. Never thought it possible to be free, to be me. And I sang that song for my diva when he was opening that children's hospital. Yeah. Standing ovation again. And it was still a quarter of his song even there. But <laughs> they allowed it. <laughs> but then... If you're already singing in English, right, and you're getting invited to sing in front of Madiba, what then makes you feel like, yeah, no, that's still not good enough? What pushes you to be like, no, I want to do this, but I want to do it in this class? The thing is this, right? Like there was a lot of black consciousness in those spaces um, at the time. Mm. And um, I felt like me singing in my language was a huge part of self-love you know, and of expressing that that black consciousness. And I used to question a lot, but why don't more people like want to, to challenge themselves, you know, to sing in Sasutu, Gastwana, you know? And I felt I was inadequate if I could not at least try. Mm. Mm. Okay. So I don't know if you guys have seen previous Imbali Live episodes, but we had Stogie T here. Do you guys remember that episode? Okay, so when he was here, he was telling us about Perm. Oh, that poet association, yeah, okay, Nabo, Nabo Lebu. I think Lebu was he a part of it. He said you were a part well. of it too. No, no, no. I was in the circles. Okay. Like, I was in the circles, but I really was a standalone act. Mm. You know, I would even just sing a cappella, you know, or ask someone. To, I mean, I remember a time I tried to even form a band and it just didn't work out. So, yeah. 
I then decided to use my skills um, as a graphic designer and IT person to just, you know, record my music and write my music on my computer at home because, yeah. you know, I could literally use any program at the time what, after what, doing IT. Yeah. What programs were you using? Because I know acapella is a big part of your musical life. Yes. But when you stepped away from these scenes to go and figure out your own sound, what were the programs you were using? Well, firstly, I got given an opportunity by Dumisani Lamini, the late, excuse me, to, to write a song for UNICEF at the time. And he actually paid me, paid me pretty well for the time, you know, when I was How much was nobody. It? It was 5,000, but it was a lot of money. For the time it was, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And out of that, I bought myself um, a sound card and a microphone and a mixer, a little mixer. And I had Fruity Loops. I used many Fruity Loops at the time because it was enough. I was just writing the songs. I didn't need quality necessarily. I just needed to write the songs, structure them, layer them, you know, like how I write my songs a cappella. And that for me was life changing because mm. from that moment on, I even withdrew from going out. I was just at home all the time, just writing the songs. Yeah. Starting with Sandy Seed. No, no, actually, it was Tolubunzima, the first song that yeah. I wrote. And then it was Sandy Seed. Do you guys remember that song? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's talk about how the song comes to you. Ah, that, there's, no, there's no formula, really, mm. for me, anyways. Maybe other people do. But there's no formula. Um, some songs come in a dream, and those are the ones that, you know, uh, you know, I know that are inspired by the ancestors. Others, literally, I sweat blood and tears in studio trying to, you know, bring them out. Yeah. Uh, but I won't lie. The ones that I truly enjoy are the ones that come in a dream, like Zandisila, for instance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell us that story. I feel like you you tend to, like, jump over the, like... The details of your life, you know, because you you told me that you were about a month pregnant Mm -hmm. when you went to bed and then woke up different. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, I I was picked up because I was way too young. I was 23 when I fell pregnant with Zazie. And I was completely freaked out. And coming from a broken home, I wanted to create a home that I'd never had. Mm-hmm. And so for me, like it was not even in my mind to not have the baby. <clears throat> but I was freaked out because I grew up, I was a tomboy. And I used to climb trees with boys when yeah. I was young, you know. So um, at best, I was good with animals, babies. Everyone was like, you, baby. No, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense at all. So... <clears throat> I went to bed very troubled when I found out I was pregnant and just wondering to myself how I was going to um, handle this and make sure that I raise my child in a in a good environment, you know, like for, for a black child to grow up in. Um, and then when I woke up in the morning, like this song was just like, I literally dreamt it and I woke up. I didn't even think of the lyrics. They just poured out of me. I literally yeah. spent like like maybe 30 minutes to an hour just like laying the song onto my, onto my computer because it didn't really come from me. It just, it was given to me. Yeah. Hmm. So do you remember what exactly the dream was? No, no, no. There wasn't, it wasn't a dream. It was a song. I woke up with the song. Yeah. Okay. I, I woke up with the song and I literally just ran, ran to my machine because something told me to open up your computer and just sing. And that's ah. all I did. Okay. So all this time I thought like you saw the words while you were sleeping. No, <laughs> the then... melody, the words, everything just came at once. It yeah. was all literally like, you know, they were just pouring out, out of me. Yeah. And um, it's been very rare for me to to have songs like that. Mm. Yeah. And Zandisile, for those of you who don't know, means? The one who fulfills her dreams. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> oh, so I think the part that we, we jumped over is how you actually get to creating songs for this album. Because initially you were making songs because you were making songs, right? It wasn't, the plan wasn't to have this album, right? No, it was just to prove to myself that I can write. Yeah. Because I felt, I felt I couldn't, mm. you know, I, I felt I could sing. For the longest time, I just wanted to sing. I remember I used to be Oskido's neighbor and I wanted him to sign me so bad. 
at Mara Street. You saw when I land, you can't even dance. <laughs> you know, and he was like, no, you must figure out what you want to do because you have not figured it out yet. And it was very true. I thought mm. I was just a singer. I didn't know that I was a writer, and I was very challenged. Yeah. To Did write it disappoint songs. you though that Oskido is this big guy in the music industry, and he's telling you? That mm, figure out what you want to do. Sorry. Hey, was either one time calls me to the studio. Ati, I must say, hey, ho, on the mic. I'm like, let me try, like I was. <laughs> like I was like, how dare you? I was actually upset. She's like, how oh, sweet. I'm just giving you a gig. I'm like, no, I want to sing. Mm. I don't want to to ad lib now on your songs. How yeah. do you know that I'm talented, Oskido? As well, then show me the talent. Mm. You know. And this was and in the we early stayed 2000s. friends like you know ever since then. He's like a big brother to me till this day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is the, in the early 2000s, right? Yes. So like then, it's actually in 2000 when I first moved to Joburg. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then also in 2000, there's this character called Sam Dana. <laughs> Have you guys heard of Sam Dana? I, I wow, think maybe you might want to tell us who Sam Dana is. <laughs> um, Sam was short for some Piwe. I don't know how it went from Sam, from Simpiwe to Sam. But when I did that song with, with Lebu Matosa, I was known as Sam Dana. So, <laughs> so most people don't even know that it's me in that song. My friends still call me Sam even now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was, I think at the time, it just felt like a dance song that you guys collaborated on. So how did you then wind up on the track, considering that, Oskido had already told you to say, hey, ho. (laughs) How do you wind up working with Lebu Matosa? Well, funnily enough, when I first moved to Joburg, I didn't even drink. I didn't even like to go out. But my story when it comes to Joburg is very strange because I literally decided one day I'm going to get on a bus and come to Joburg. I don't even have a place to stay. I don't have a scholar, but I'm going to come here and I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. And then on the way here, I called a friend of mine from PE. And he was like, Kofi, I need a place to stay. And he calls his brother. And his brother's like, okay, while you figure yourself out, you can stay here with us. So I was staying, I was sharing a room with Abna Ivo, you know, oh, at, at the my actress. friend Kofi's house. Um, the, my, my brother's, my friend's brother, rather. Um, and then within two weeks of staying there, I'm, I met this girl who loved to party. He's like, ah. Oh, well, I've got a spare room and, you know, you can pay when you can pay. If you can't, you, you know, you don't have to. My parents pay for it anyway. Well, I'm like, are you for real? <laughs> so I ended up living with this girl who loved to party. And because number of Funu she was in Dene, I would like follow after her. And then I'd get so bored because I didn't drink. Yeah. I didn't even like to dance. But through that, I got to meet so many people in the, in the industry, including Mosquito, by the way. I, I met Mosquito Zuhabe. And Lebu Matosa through Hape as well. Mm. So I was just thrown into, you know, um, this dance scene that was not even my style really. Yeah. But Lebu and I got along so well. We we're actually like really good friends. And it was by surprise that I found like this uh, open mic sessions because it was not Hape's vibe at all. Mm. But one day she was bored. There was nothing else going on. And then she was like, oh, there's this thing. Let's try it out and see. Like, it's poetry, what, what? Let's go. And then I found my home. Yeah. That day, yeah. But then when it came to making How Can yes. with Lebu, did you guys sit down together and write it together? Did you record it together? How did that happen? She called me to studio. It was, she used to work a lot with that um, DJ, what's his name? Christos? Yes. Yeah. So she called me to come. She was like, try something here. I really like your voice and I want to give you this opportunity. And obviously I jumped at it. Yeah. Um, um, and she actually paid me like then, then. And she paid me handsomely too. Like yeah. we was one of those people. She was fair. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's how it happened. Out of the blue. And her and I used to go visit her like a lot. You know, just chill her and I that her girlfriend really like got mad at me. And she... <laughs> She didn't understand, but why do you like this kid so much? Yes. Lebu saw something in me and she wanted to invest. Yeah. But that's still four years before your debut comes out. Mm -hmm. So how do we go from, I'm doing the the open mics, I retreat and I go and write my own songs to, I am now signed at Gallo. 
so what happened is that there was this other poet friend of mine, Uzi, right? So after I'd written, I think about five songs or so, he had heard them. And they were a cappella, you know, with all the layers that, you know, I learned from my graphic design days. Yeah. Uzi said, asked me to, for, for, for us to collaborate on one of his sets, like with me and the music on back tracks and him and his poetry. And it so happened that at that event, there was Roshni Munsami. Roshni mm -hmm. Munsami used to do... Conjure. Urban voices. Yes. And then the other one is Roshni. She used to do two festivals. So then Roshni... And like now I'm like seven months pregnant now. Like I am, I'm really big. Yeah. Roshni comes to me and she's like, you know, actually, I think you could do this for a living. Why don't you just give me your, your demo and I'll shop you around because I'd like to book you for next year for my Urban Voices um, Festival. And until that time, I had been really scared of sharing my music because I'd heard such horrible stories about the industry, how they steal your music from you and you can't mm. prove anything and they give it to other artists, you know, and you basically effed. Yeah. Um, so I I've been holding on to my music like this, but something something just told me that day. But let it go. Give her the music. Let yeah. it go and see what happens. So I then gave her like, and I didn't hear from her for months. So I thought it didn't come to anything. And then one day I got a call from Zippo's Tolle saying he wants to sign me and give me a premiere deal, like top three artists in SA, like big budgets. Yeah. You know, and it that was just like my. Move to Joburg truly was magical, to be quite mm. honest. Mm. And one of the, the common threads, I think, through your story is that people were always willing to pay you and they were always willing to pay you a lot of money. How I did you manage that? that? <laughs> Jay, like, wait, they, they were just like, they were just showing off because I honestly, I signed a, a big artist deal and I was a newcomer, mm. you know, in SA at the time and no no other artists were getting those kinds of budgets you yeah. know and and then it was marketed properly everything was just done right and i got the even for the video the budget that i wanted and it it just felt like the timing was just good yeah yeah you because know, i feel like i was just lucky i was just you know i was just lucky you could you know it, I could have been one of those who would first had to be a backup singer to, mm. to try and work their way up. Yeah. But you didn't even do a hey or a ho. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So after you, you get this call and you decide you want to sign with Gallo, do you take all the songs you've been working on and create Zandisile from them? Or do you start from scratch and create? Actually, I had about seven songs by the time Sipo called. So um, I just had to add about five more mm. songs to the album. I literally had the album ready. I just had to, you know, add more more songs. So, you know, Zandisile was my second song that I wrote and I already knew that that's going to be the title of the yeah. album because of how it came about. So I literally had the album. I mean, I, I remember um, Tribe. I wrote Tribe in studio, like literally, and we just jammed and, and we wrote Tribe. It was yeah. that easy because I already had a formula, you know, like this is how this album is going to be. Yeah. And I hear that initially the some of the execs at Gallo were saying, your music is too Marabi style. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's not going to fit with where they're trying to go. So did they make you change anything? <laughs> were you willing to change anything? No one makes me change my songs. <laughs> But did they approach you like, maybe make it a bit more? No, like, I was lucky because actually Sipos Tolle believed in my music. Yeah. You know, had he not been in my corner, perhaps, because I was a newcomer, you know. Mm. But having someone believe so much in me at that stage of my career, it also um, gave me enough um, um, strength to believe in myself mm. and to know that, you know, um, I'm the only one who understands what I'm trying to do and where I'm trying to get. And that's not to say that I didn't have problems with execs trying to, you know, tell me this is how it is. And I was like, no, but ha have you ever been a brand when? Mm. <laughs> well. I was like, no, I think I know what I'm doing, but yeah. obviously I need your support, but please have faith that I know what I'm doing. If you, if you can just do that and then I'll allow you to do your piece and I'm going to do my piece. But when it comes to the creative process, I got it. Okay. So one of the songs that came from that album that I think all of us here used to hear 
all the time was Ndi Redi. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. And every time I heard it, I thought you were just in this triumphant space where you're like, I'm ready to fly, I'm ready to soar, just let me do it. But you said it didn't come around like that for you. I was stressed. Mm. I felt like I was knocking on doors and people didn't have enough faith to see my vision and my dream. And I, I was very stressed at the time. And um, because like you said, someone's like, but this is Marabi. I'm like, no, but listen to the mm. music. This is not Marabi. This is Simpiwe. Mm. This, this is music from today. It's just that you have not heard a sound like this in a while. So I was stressed. I think I actually wrote Ndiredi towards the end of the album. Mm. Not, not, not at the beginning. And I was frustrated that my vision was not being seen. So yeah. it was almost me screaming at the universe, but why, why, why won't you see what I'm trying to do and be the wind beneath my wings? Yeah, that's awesome. So before we go into the um, audience questions for now, I want to talk about the artwork, especially because you come from a graphic design space. The artwork seemed like an exercise book, right? And it had the XB, mm. I want to tell you exactly before I get it wrong, XB2380 manuscript. Mm -hmm. And in certain places online, the title of your album is not manuscript. <laughs> it's all of that. <laughs> so what was the significance of that? Um, XB was the um, car code for Butterworth. Like ah. the cars from Butterworth, that's the code is XB. Okay. And then 2380 is the day I was born, 23. And 80 is the year I was born. Is so. that deep? <laughs> <laughs> I would have never known that. Yeah, so it was just me saying, this is who I am. Like, you know, if you can decode this, then you, you will know much more about me then. Ah, mm -hmm, that's so interesting. Okay, so... In a moment, we're going to talk about um, the albums that came after Zandisile. But for now, if you have any questions about anything we've discussed so far or anything that we missed in this period of Simpio's life, now is your chance to ask your question. No? Um, Hold on one second. <laughs> that, that's also in a, in a future album, right? It's not on Zandisile. Yeah, no, my name is not on Zandisile. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, great. Then we're going to move on. What will come? Oh, is there a question? Oh, I'm going to give you a mic. Hold on. Hold on one second. We want you to sound great on YouTube, you know. <laughs> and on that note, uh, you can go and subscribe on youtube.com forward slash Helen Harimbi. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you're from Flagstaff. Where about? Because I'm also from there. Oh wow! Because I ate. My gosh, I I spent like maybe a year there. It's Lalini. I just don't remember the name of Zaz Land and Saraguzo. And I stayed there with my my paternal grandmother, who was very very strict. Um, I don't remember the the name of the village, but I I, I stayed as Lalini. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I think the other question I'll ask it later. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Bye, Lanza. Hi. Hi, Zampio. Hi, Jen. I'm good, thank you. With these budgets that you are getting now. How much were the budgets? <laughs> <Tell us>. no. <laughs> I want to know did you never at some point get overwhelmed that, yo, how am I going to pay this money back? Because when a label gives you money, they're investing. So did you never feel like, yo, 10,000, how am I going to return? Did you ever? No, I was no. like, you know, you guys gave me the money. You must make it back. <laughs> you must market the album properly so that you make the money back. And my album did make that, their money back. Yeah. I mean, it more than made <laughs> their money back. But, um, okay, cool. Uh, do you have a they question? They were not loaning me the money. They were investing in the album. So okay. therefore, they had to find ways to make sure that they make that money back from the album. Okay, that's going to be our last question for now. Right. Hello. Hi. 
Speaking oh, to the mic, girl. Hello, hi. Hi, sister. Hello. And you make a reference to a lot of, like a lot of times you make a reference to your ancestors. So in the making of this album, where was your spirituality really? What did you do to regain strength from that? And yeah. In the making of Zandisida. In the making of Zandisida, yeah. It actually was a very weird time for me because I was reading a lot of Credo Mutua and Elizabeth Heitch as well, who is um, a yogi. Um, and she would speak about, you know, the many lives she has lived, like the many, you know, different um, times, you know, like eras that she has lived, like, you know, basically she so was talking about reincarnation a lot, and then there was Kodomu to the other side, and I think similar things. So if you actually look at my artwork, it references those two um, writers a lot. And with Credo Mutua, I actually continue to even reference him in my other works. I think I stopped referencing Credo Mutua after the third album, Culture Noir. Mm. Awesome. Um, I think we're going to move on into the second section. Um, and particularly, I want to start it like this because everything you've told us, your music reflects your life. And you, like you were saying to the young lady, you draw strength from it. You, um, it mirrors some things that happen in your life. Because I want to take you back to September 2005. Mm -hmm. On this day that you are driving to Ferenaging. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I see. So, do you remember anything out of the ordinary about that day? I remember feeling some kind of way before we left the house. Because I had sent my band ahead, you know, and I was driving with my fiancé at the time. Yeah. And I remember like a split second of me wondering, what if I should have gone with the band? Mm. But I like quickly just, you know, um, dismissed the, the feeling. And then I remember knowing for a fact we're going to hit this guy, you know, um, and you know, like the whole your life flashes be before your eyes thing, it actually is real here. Hey? Yeah. Like in a split second, your whole life just flashes. And I remember feeling a lot of calm, like an acceptance, but well, okay, I might not make it out of this, but feeling very calm about it. Mm. And just one moment of saying, oh, Abantwanabam, you know, but even then knowing that everything is as it should be. Yeah. And then I don't remember the moment of impact. And I remember coming to afterwards and my face felt like it was tight, tight, tight. And I was drenched in something. And it took me like a long time to realize, but the guy had been killing a case of Chibuku. So oh. I'm drenched in, 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 in Chibuku, like from, from head like all over. And I remember holding my face like this because I, something was wrong. And when I said that, and I felt like my face was, like, I'm sorry to, to, but it was basically open and I had to hold it together like this. And then I remember like, my eyes full of glass because mm. we were driving a bit tall, like those old ones. Yeah. And those ones don't have shutterproof glass. So it's like real glass. So you had glass in I your eyes. I had glass in my eyes. Yeah. And then I was thinking, I, <laughs> And I actually was calm even after that. I'm the one who called the ambulance, who called my band, but no turn around. There can't be a, a gig, forget it. Yeah. You know, and they came, they turned around and they, they picked me up because the ambulance was not coming. Oh, no, no, they came and then the ambulance came like while they were there mm. and it took me to the, the first clinic. They wouldn't treat me because I was pregnant. Mm. You know, they didn't treat pregnant um, women there. So there I was lying for hours there, telling them, please, can you just at least check my eyes? Mm. I put glass in my eyes. But this 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 butch lady, like this nurse didn't want like it took me a while to 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 understand why she was so hostile towards me. She actually thought I was drunk at oh, eight months. Because of the chibuku. Because of the chibuku. So she she thought I was drunk and she was so hostile towards me. So yeah. I had to wait for about four hours to be moved to Garden City Clinic where they treat pregnant women and then three more hours for the doctor to come, the eye doctor to come. And then I remember hearing the clink of the glass as she was yes, we were removing the glass from my eyes. Yeah. And onto the petri dish. And then I remember thinking, okay, just accept your beauty is gone. Mm. <laughs> your eyesight may be gone too. 
And like one good thing about this is that you, you can tell that your son is still alive. So that, yeah. that's a good thing. But you're gonna, you might need to to make a career change because you know your industry is very fickle. If yeah. your beauty is gone and you can't see, you may not be able to continue with this career. Yeah. So there I am lying in hospital plotting and planning my next move because I was like survivor must yeah. <laughs> one way or the other. So what was coming as the next move? Because you'd spent your whole life up until that point wanting to be a musician. And now you're I a musician. I actually had no idea. But I was like, I will survive somehow. Let me just think about it. Let me just think calmly about it. You know, but, but what was most important is that I was accepting. I was not fighting it. I was like, okay, this is my new normal now. Yeah. What are you going to do? What's your next move? Yeah. And then, you know, I was like, hey, IT, well, your eyesight, if it's gone, you can't go back to IT. Mm. What are you going to do? And I just told myself, I will find a way. Somehow I'll find a way, but this is not the end. It may be the end of my music career, but it can't be the end of my life because I'm a survivor. Yeah. Mm. So what was the, the first point where you went back to music? Oh, it was very rough mm. for me, like the, the healing process. I mean, I had two surgeries on my face. The first one, like my face was terribly like disfigured mm. um, the first time. And the doctor was not caring about my beauty, but just about repairing the, the damaged tissues on my face, which is what she was supposed to do. Yeah. And like cleaning out the glass and the chibuku from the sky as well. <laughs> Um, so after I started healing, which took like two years, um, I ha- my face was disfigured. Like people would look at me and be, and sh- be shocked. And it hurt my feelings so bad. Like, mm. Is it really that bad? Like my face was literally like this. Yeah. And then like there was this pouch of skin under my eye. And I was like, what the hell is going on? Mm. And then after the second um, surgery, then this is how I look now. And it's much better. And I think that my scar gives me character now. Yeah. Um, I've actually come to love it. I would even draw it out. Like, you know, I've noticed, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was a long climb back to normal yeah. for me after that. And spiritually, it actually taught me a lot mm-hmm. about my character and what is important in life and what's not. Yeah, mm-hmm. the the album that came after that accident was the multi summer winning five summers. Hey now. <laughs> <laughs> it was the one love movement on Bantu Biko Street. Yes. What was the first song you wrote for that album? Actually, it was Bantu Biko. It mm. was Bantu Biko Street. That was the first song that I wrote because I felt triumphant and. I, you know, I guess like almost losing it all made me realize that it's so much more than just about things to have like, um, and accolades and, and being pretty and like having pretty, pretty, like life is so much more than just mm. about that. And that I could walk on Bantu Biko Street with my, held, my head held high because I know who I am. Yeah. And um, no amount of accolades could make me that person. Because I literally, you know, was hiding from society for a while after that. And then I just went into studio. So with me, when I'm going through like heavy upheavals, I run to studio. Yeah. So I was hiding in there and I was writing this music and I was finding myself again after yeah. the accident. Yeah. And were you nervous that such a huge icon being used as the title of your album would then open you up to people saying, but what does she know or make you this poster child for this generation? I mean, like, there was a time when uh, our media felt that, that they make or break artists and that if they say no, then you say no. Mm. Luckily, those days are over. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there were quite a few um, media people that did not agree with me writing about Bantu Biko and they had all of these uh, things that they were saying. But I'm, I remember this one guy was like, I'm using Biko's name for cloud, blah, blah, blah. I was mm. like, did you even listen to the song? What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. 
And I remember this one other guy as well. He literally just didn't even entertain the album. And he was an amazing, the great writer and, 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 and critic. He just came from, from my person, like my person. I was like, so you, did you even listen to the music? Because it sounds like you were just coming at me personally. You were not critiquing the album. And I, I think it's because they, they felt I dared to talk about big things like that. Um, whereas I was coming from Abu and Yusil and them, like, where like, I kept the politic out of mm. it, but just like, you know, focused on black consciousness and, and self-care and self-love. Yeah. So I guess they felt I was politicizing my work and they were like, politics don't belong in music, which was mm. quite strange for me <laughs> because, you know, if you think about Abu Humasikela, about Jonas Kwangwa, Abu Miriam Makeba and, and, and how they changed the political landscape through like their music, it didn't make sense to me. Um, but luckily those days are gone. Now people get, you know, to, to, to critique you directly. Like they don't need a, a medium to do that. Yeah. I like that you mentioned self-care because I think that's something that a lot of people think about when they think of your music. Um, is crying part of your self-care? Oh my, I'm a cry baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a serious crybaby, but I cry in private. I don't uh, like to for people to see me hurting, you yeah. know, because I'm a firstborn at home. I'm used to taking care of everyone. Yeah. So I'm supposed to be the one who takes care, not the one who's taken care of. Mm, I feel you. <laughs> but I'm a big crybaby. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I'm asking you is because the, the imagery that shows up a lot on Maine is Inyembe's Emeshwen. So can you maybe tell us about what that song how that song came to you? Um, you know, Musum Shlanga has got this song, Ding in Ding. Like, I don't remember like the, the title of the song, itself, but it's through something Ding in Ding in it. And I, I wrote a song for Mambusi at a time when she was hurting a lot. Mm. And we could tell that she's not going to win this battle of cancer. And I wrote the song for her at a time where I felt South Africa eats her children. Um, we we don't realize the great greatness that we live amongst. And I wrote it, I guess, as a song of comfort for her and maybe comfort for me as well. Yeah. And I remember I had to stop a few times in studio when I was recording that song because I, I was so emotional. I could not stop yeah. crying. So... Tiki Tiki instead of Ding in Ding, Tiki Tiki, Tiki is money. Um, and towards the end, Mambusi was very, was struggling. Mm -hmm. And I felt, how does someone so great, someone who has given so much to this country, um, have to struggle financially? How yeah. is that even possible? You know, and I was like, I hope that will never be me. Mm. because I could see myself in her. But yo, is this how we're going to end? Mm. <laughs> is this how it's going to end for us? So yes, I wrote that song for Mambus. Yeah. And that was of Culture Noir, right? Yes. And word is that you actually opened a club in Norwood mm -hmm. called Culture Noir. Very briefly. <laughs> That's why I'm saying word is, because I never saw it. So what was the idea behind that specific space and what happened to it? Why did it not materialize? Uh, I was young and not business savvy um, at all. The idea behind Culture Noir, the club, was that I would create the menus because I love to cook. Mm. And I'm a fusion cook. I mix Asian with Nigerian with that, you know, and, and I find a way to make. So the idea was for me to to care for people the other way that I know how mm. through cooking and then I would create the menus and then they'd be cooked, they'd be made by, you know, um, Chef. the staff and yeah. say yes. And then I would be there sometimes and just serving the people and just being amongst them and perhaps maybe once in a blue moon I would also perform with a resident band, mm. etc. 
But I was too young and I'd never had a business before and I really sucked at it, to be quite <laughs> honest. So, yeah. It didn't last long at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you like Nigerian food? Yeah, I love Nigerian food. I love West African f- I love African food mm. in general and Asian food. For me, like those two cultures, they, they, they make amazing food. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm asking you about Nigeria because I'm thinking of... Jollof. Chibok. Oh, <laughs> in Nigeria. I don't want any smoke with uh, jollof uh, wars. I don't know which is better, Ghanaian or Nigerian. But um, the, the original is yeah, better. Which is what? Senegal. <laughs> I'd like to apologize to our YouTube viewers. It's not me. It's Please direct. <laughs> so let's talk about Chibok because it comes from the album that comes after that, which is Firebrand. Mm-hmm. And do you guys know where Chibok is? It's in Nigeria. And it was 2014, right? Mm. So, okay, I'm going to let you explain it. Otherwise, I'm going to explain oh, everything. Oh, okay. Um, Chibok, is it a, is it, it's a town or it's a village in, in Nigeria um, where Boko Haram abducted about how many um, girls, 200 and something? Yeah, it was 200 and something. Um, and they disappeared with them into the forests, mm. etc. And they were raped and they were killed. It was just a, a, a horror um, show of note. And some of the girls came back. They were school girls, literally. They were taken from a school. Mm. Uh, some of them came back pregnant. Some of them didn't come back at all. Like they, they died during the process. But I have to comment Nigeria. They actually really worked hard to get the girls back. The girls back. And um, when I heard the story, I, I was just really moved to write that song about how um, we are expendable mm. as black girls. Because even for Nigeria to actually act, it took a while. Even in the end, they did act, but it took a while for them to act. There were so many um, campaigns out of Nigeria to say, bring back our girls. Mm. The Nigerian government was not doing anything for a while. And then they finally acted because of uh, international pressure. Yeah. Um, and by then, it was too late for some of those, of those young girls. So Chibok was just uh, a lament for me. Mm. of how cheap our lives are as black girls. Yeah. It was also a song that you open with an English verse. Mm. And there's some English (laughs) verses. Um, So I'm curious about when you decided it was now okay to go back to the English. Like, what happened for you to be like, oh, actually, I can do both? Because I'd proven to myself what I wanted to prove. Yeah. Um, That... I love my culture and I endorse my culture and I live it. Um, I had done that. So now I could open myself to the world Mm. because the one thing that used to trouble me a lot had been conquered by then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your love for your culture is palpable and your love for the continent also, like in your work and just in how you are. Um, and I'm interested in your friendships with Asha and Bweka mm-hmm. because they then joined you on your symphony orchestra. Mm-hmm. How does that happen? Um, Asha and I had been friends actually for quite a while since those days that um, MTV Base brought her to, to SA. Yeah. Um, the first time we met was for the Joy of Jazz. And I met her and Kobam still used to work with her as well, like the pianist and singer. And I don't know, like we just clicked. We actually met, for, like, I, was, I was invited for a dinner with, with, with her and her band. Yeah. And myself and my band. And we, we just clicked and we decided that we were going to be sisters. I mean, she would even invite me on her stages when, when, when she performed and she would come and I would cook for her. We even tried to do a song together. It's just, it just didn't come together at the time um, because I felt we were kindred spirits in many ways. Mm. Um, and I'm a big fan of collecting women from all over the continent that, are, that for me, I resonate with. Yeah. And she was the first one I collected <laughs> at, at the time. 
And um, I then went on to to be the convener of the African Union's Arts and Culture chapter, mm. where um, together with a, a lot of help from the AU, we gathered artists from all types of disciplines from all the countries on, on the continent except for one, I think Morocco, because of their human rights abuses. Yeah. <laughs> so like they, they're not allowed. But, you know, photographers, painters, singers, mm. Um, writers like we invited and and we we brought at us in culture chapter for agenda 20 what Kanji? I forgot but we I I had been to Ethiopia at the time and then it was still um Miss Lamine Zuma who was the chairperson of the AU mm-hmm. and I requested a meeting with her to um, propose this idea um, that they, there is a flaw in their thinking if they would keep the arts out of mapping a way forward for the continent. Yeah. Whereas the arts are the glue that hold us together, that make us family in a way, that make the, that that get us to 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 be more familiar with each other than than not. Yeah. And she jumped at the idea and she gave me the budget and we wrote that chapter and I think it's gathering dust somewhere at the <laughs> AU now. <laughs> but even through that, I get I got to meet a lot more of my African counterparts and I mm. kept in touch with them and I would be exposed to so much more music by actually knowing the people from those countries. They would say, no, listen to this one, listen to that one. And 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 I've always been passionate about the continent, as as you know, in, in even our languages. If you remember, I went to Parliament yes. to propose Zulu as one of the main languages instead of just English and Afrikaans. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to push all of that work because I believe that we have to walk the talk, not just talk and say I'm a Pan Africanist. Show us mm. if you're Pan Africanist. So I was I was trying to work that journey, not just in music but in my activism as well. Yeah. And that is how I then got introduced to so much more of African art than I'd been acquainted with before. Yeah. And then to come back to my question, mm-hmm. then you decided to do the symphony experience. Yes. So now I decided that even in my music, I have to include the pan-Africanism and I wanted to put... African women at the forefront, especially after like the Chibo Girls song, and I, I said to myself, this unity must come from us by us mm. as, as as black girls. And and therefore, you know, with my symphony, I'll always have two African women that yeah. perform with me. And I will always try to make sure that the whole band is made of women where I can help it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then just Africans, because, yeah. you know, we can do amazing things, but we just don't get the opportunities to do those things or the budgets yeah. for those things. And your, your Pan-African mission continues with this upcoming album. Yes. That we're going to talk about <laughs> in a moment. So please save your Bamako questions for after. But if you have any questions for about anything that we've discussed or any periods that we've discussed so far, sedisa has got a question here. Please put your hand up if you have a, a question. You have so many questions, guys. I'm going to take three for now. And then at the end, <laughs> at the end, you'll, you'll, you'll get more questions. Hello, Simpi. Hi, Budi. Why, Bella? Sorry? Who is Pilili? Yeah, Pilili Gunjan. I get Pilili now. So, hey, I'm a So, what what's becoming apparent in in all like at least so far in what you guys have discussed is how you how you sort of function irrespective of the the other stuff that happens in your life. So, you are like doing this stuff with the AU and, you know, you're writing the chapters and all, but at the same time, there's this great pushback from home online with people telling you that, no, you you can't be writing those articles. Just stick to the music. And then there's the other personal stuff about, you know, she's involved with basically stuff that, that 
if I, as a man, was doing, for instance, wouldn't really, you know what I mean? So I'm just interested in that, in how you, in your, 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 your escape routes, besides the music, like what those are, the things that, that, that bring you back. Off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other one, I'm sorry, um, has to do with your connection to the poetry scene, like early in the day. Is it something that you still hold or is it something that you've kind of let go entirely? Because I feel like that was a very critical stage, like in, your, in the formation of your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Should I answer? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, actually, that pushback started ar ar around the time I was doing the AU work. And for me, it was really unbelievable um, at the time. And as someone who lives with depression, it really impacted me greatly to a point where I, I, I tend to practice lots of self-care by staying away from harmful spaces as yeah. much as I can. And you are very right that had I been a man, I would not have suffered half the stuff that I've had to endure just because I'm a woman with a voice. Mm. Um, and not, it, it totally is very, very harmful. And um, But it, this work is important and it must be done um, somehow. But I've also learned that self-care is very, very important. You don't have to be sister soldier all the time. <laughs> you can definitely retreat and and take care of yourself uh, because you are not the only one who can do this work. Yeah, you know there there are many others. So like you can't feel like you are the only one who can take this on and and fight it. Like there there, there are many there there are many and more and more women are coming out. You know like ideas that um, we had. Like 10 years ago, now I'm becoming the norm everywhere. And I'm like, yeah, we used to be attacked for these ideas. <laughs> now, yeah. now, like, they're, they're normal. You know, like, the, um, the woke generation is here. And, yeah. and, and, and it's good to know that there's more of us. And in our little corners, you know, we, 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 we push the fight forward. Yeah. So self-care is your escape. Self-care is very important. Okay. Believe me, because you have to make sure that you can still wake up tomorrow and have the energy to fight. Yeah. And if today you don't feel like it, don't feel like you're the only one who can do this work. That there are many of us. Yeah. Mm. Cool. You have another question? Hello. Hi. Um, so I wanted to ask if there's some kind of documentation of the symphony experiences that we could buy or um, just be involved in or... It, get access to actually um, because I wanted to go to the last one I think it was in December but I couldn't and like I was dying basically <laughs> inside um, so I just wanted to know about that and also I think that's an amazing project and the next one I will really try to be there awesome can you pass the mic what? well one thing I learned with the symphony right um, is that the first symphony, like it, it really bankrupted me, hey. And and I learned that I didn't need the visuals. Mm. So with this one, I've got the audio, and as soon as Bamako is taken off, I will work on doing the post production for the audio, and I will have it on your iTunes and all your other the platforms service. for it. Yes, yes. Cool. So yes, it's there. Cool. Have a question? Uh, uh, yes. Um. So I sort of discovered your music quite late. Um, at the time, I was only exposed to Sutu music and uh, later on Swati music. Mm -hmm. And then I came to realize there's so much more because I was raised in such a way that I wasn't exposed to much music in general. And one of the songs that surprisingly resonated with me was Mayine. And I heard where you, you wrote, who you wrote the song for and why you wrote the song, but listening to the song now, in retrospect, do you have any emotional, because honestly, the way I've received the song itself, it's helped me so much and it, it feels so, so, um, so deep, I would say, for lack of better words, so deep to me. It's, it's such a powerful song, 
uh, what do you what do you feel listening to the song again, even though it's your own music? What do you feel in retrospect now? Um, I learned to write music from a point of healing, right? And I usually write music when I'm hurting a lot. You know, it's like some kind of therapy for me. When the world becomes too much, I then retreat into studio and find my healing there. So I like to actually say to people that they must take the song and own it and tell me what it means to them because it basically pitches different messages to different people. And you will have your own story with it, how, how this song carried you through. And I, I hear those stories all, all the time. Flex. <laughs> and I was not even. <laughs> and I am a healer. I come from a, a family of, of, of healers. And that is why I try to humble myself to my dreams so I can receive these messages of healing for not just myself, but for all of us. Cool. So we're going to move on into the third section, um, which is your, your multifaceted side. Because 2013, uh, a renegade uh, called Simpue comes mm -hmm. out. And that was written with Dr. Pumla Gola. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the process of putting out a book. Uh, well, I mean, I didn't write the book at all. Um, Pumla wrote the book from a position of having known me and followed my art, my activism, and my personal life. Mm. So, like, that's not my book. It's written about me, yeah. but I did not um, have any contribution to the book whatsoever. Oh, which, I thought it was part memoir, so you no. sat with her. I'm actually writing my memoirs now. Oh. <laughs> and um, I'm glad that the book helped a lot of women um, um, come to terms with their activism and with their strength and with their challenges that they go, that they go through. But I did wish I had been given more of a voice um, mm. in it because she had required my permission. And I said, well, okay, then I'll read the, the book. And, and so now when I tried to say, okay, but this is, this is not how, how it happened. This is how it happened. She owned my story and I felt a little bit um, like she took my voice away from me mm. um, because she... After having had asked for permission to write my book, now when I correct her, she's like, "No, actually, I want I like this version." But I'm like, "This is my life you're talking yeah. about. You cannot talk to take my voice away from me." Um, especially if we are both feminists. So for me, there was just a little bit of that that I had an issue with, but I also heard a lot of positive feedback about the book and how it empowered women out there and I was very happy for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at least now you're writing your own memoir in your own oh, voice. I'm so lazy. Oh, I've only <laughs> written five chapters this year. <laughs> keep going, keep going. We need it. Um, but speaking of taking your voice away from you, in 2018, you sought to correct that, literally. Um, and you went and had surgery. Mm, yeah. So at what point did you feel like you were losing your voice? Um, so as someone who grew up in church, right, you don't warm up your voice in church. You just go out there and you belt it out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know? So I was very guilty of abusing my voice and not taking care of it. And um, over many years, it then suffered from wear and tear. Um, and at first I thought I, I just need to warm the voice up more, but it was just getting progressively worse. Mm. And so that I had to just go and, and, and then do a checkup. And it happened that I had scar tissue on my vocal cords. I had holes in my vocal oh, cords. Wow. I, I literally had been damaging my voice over the years, um, and not doing anything to remedy that. Yeah. So then I had to have laser surgery to remove the scarring. And then, like, injections of, was it collagen or something like that into the holes mm. to just smooth out the vocal cords. 
And trust me, you know, after not being able to speak for two weeks, I learned my lesson. You'll never see me not warm up my voice again. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I got a second wind because I literally was so scared I was going to lose my voice mm. completely. Mm. But, you know, you also established an acting career for yourself. So if the singing doesn't work I out, did not I'm establish an acting career. Hey? Like, I just get headhunted from time to time. I know this role, we think it'd be perfect really? for it. I've so you never, never have to audition? I've never. I've always been called to say, like, we like this role for you. Just come and, 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 and like, my, my daughter, for instance, did that. She yeah. said to me, I've got a role for you. You you, you you must go through the motions of auditioning for it, but I know I want you for the role. You're yeah. perfect for it. Um, please, will you do me this favor to actually come and audition? Yeah. Um, and, and even the first one, same thing. I was called and I was told, like, this role is for you. Wow. Please, please come and read for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first one was Temba, right? Yes. And the second one was Jokoya Hao. Jokoya Hao, yes. Which is... Pretty much about Abu Mama Bumtandas, right? And activism. Yes. It was loosely based on Winnie Mandela's life. Mm -hmm. There you go. The activism again. They're going <laughs> to tell you to keep quiet. I don't want to be sister soldier, guys. <laughs> You're done with that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the albums that we are going to hear and the albums we haven't heard. First, there is a 2012 album that you recorded in America. How do you even know that? Yeah, I know things. <laughs> what happened to that album? Because it was supposed to be an album of covers, right? Yes. Um, Galo went under and released all of us. It, and only kept the older artists, like a boy who must get in them. All of us who are younger artists, they're like, no, you guys still have the energy to go out there and find different labels. Yeah. There was a big slump at, at, at that time in the music industry because of uh, piracy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Gallo then released all of us and I had just recorded that album. I just come back from LA with that album and it was not finished. It still needed some touch ups. And they gave me the album, like, no, you can take the album with you, it's fine. Yeah. Um but it would then take me so much longer to, you know, gather myself and 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 you know, um chart a way forward. That by the time I was ready, I I felt I could not have made my audiences wait for so long to just release an album of covers. That was just mm. an insult to them. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, this album will have to wait until I actually release an album of original songs and then perhaps I can release it after after that. So that's how come the album has never come out. Yeah. Literally because I told myself, you know, it's been how long? Three years since I last released and then next thing I'm releasing covers, it just didn't feel right to me. Yeah. So. And now I feel like it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah, I feel like it's too late now to release yeah. an album of covers. Well, like. maybe you can perform those covers when you reopen Culture Noir as a space. Yeah. Just think about it. I'll think um, about it. <laughs> but when I spoke to you in 2018 and you just had this deal with Universal, you said that you were going to put out two albums in one year. They said no. No? No, Universal was like, ah, eh. We too want much. new music. Yeah, and yeah, no, also it was too much. Just, you know, double the budgets in one year. They were like, no, the album, the one, one of the albums would be affected by that. So it's, it's, not, it's not a good idea. Yeah. And I need to focus on one album. Uh, we, I mean, even for um, the Symphony Experience, I'm going to have to wait. I even have an album of Amahubo as well. And not, even with that one, I have to wait until... I've, I've released this one. I've got work for you guys for days, eh? Like, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of timing. And you have, you had intended to put out an a cappella album. Yes. Of all the songs we already know. Yes, like, greatest hits and then, and then like, the original a cappella versions of those songs. Yeah. But it was just too much at once. And, I you mean, know. if you've done the a cappellas, I would say put it out on SoundCloud and let people remix it. And let's see what comes of it. No, Universal's going to kill me. Never yeah. mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, like, I can't see myself trying to convince Spot Lamini to do yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's right not going to happen. Mm. But baby number five is coming. Yes. Bamako. Bamako, yes. And for those of you who don't know, Bamako is in Mali. Mm -hmm. Why is Mali such... Oh, 
let's say, why is Bamako such an important place in your heart? I, um, I was just continuing with my journey of pan-Africanism and, and, and of walking the talk. And for me, West African music really rocks my world. Yeah. Um, especially like when they play those string instruments, whether it be a bass or a guitar or a kora, you know, for me, it feels like string music was born in Mali and then it went to the world um, after that. So um, I was, you know, talking to the NR at the time about how we would approach this album. Mm. And at the time, I had already finished writing all the songs. I produced them myself, by the way. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I felt the, like, the album needed something more. I was like, actually, this album can be great, great, great. It's good already. Because I literally played all the like the bass, I played that, I played the the, the piano, I, I did all of that. Yeah. But I felt it could, and this was the first time really. I and actually even with uh, Culture Noir, I, mm. I had done that on my Yine or Nkwenkwezi. I played those. Da, 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 da. I created all of that stuff. Yeah. Um. So now I'm. I was just like bantering with with the, the NR and, and saying to maybe we should have just one song and do it with Salif on the album. Look at and this, then, like, first name basis. <laughs> That's Salif Keita for the rest of us. <laughs> and, and, um, and we're talking about, like, different producers we could work with. We even had Moreira as, as one of, of the ideas. Yeah. And then, and then he says to me, but why not just try and get Salif to, to, to produce the album with his band and you there? go to Miley. I'm like, are you f- f- sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a grown up show, you know. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious right now? Is it even possible? Because I didn't think it was possible. Yeah. I, even though I knew Chris, like his manager, but I felt Universal would never give those kinds of budgets. Yeah. Um, for that. And he was like, well, you won't know if you don't try it. So how about we try and see, you know, how much it will cost and what Universal will say. And three months later, I was on my way to Mali wow. to, to, to record with, with, with Salif um, and his band. Yeah. Amazing musicians. Truly, truly amazing. And I even had, you know, the, the honor of featuring Salif in one of the songs. Yeah. And I'm not going to say more about that because I want it to be a nice surprise. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, I think it's a really great album. And given the opportunity, it has the capacity to, you know, be a good contender for a Grammy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I, I found interesting about the album when I heard it is... Oh, you've heard it. <laughs> oh, look at you. <laughs> um, is that you kind of return to that minimalist style of yours, mm-hmm. but you also bring the radio friendliness mm-hmm. in, in some parts. And even with uh, Uskonzile, mm-hmm. it's very sparse when you start out. So sonically, was that intentional for you or did that input come from Salif and his band? Actually, most of that song is me, darling. I <laughs> I played those bass lines. I played, you know, lots of, of stuff on there. Yes, I had a guitarist from Mali play on it, but the structure, like the production itself, including the parts that you like that are more groovy. Because, I mean, yeah. I'm still young, guys. 40 is very young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I um, I had so much more control over this album than... Um, any of my other albums. Culture Noir, I also had that kind of control as well, except I did not credit myself mm. um, because I didn't feel I was good enough. But in Kwenkwezi, I literally did that song. Mayina, yeah. I did that song, like the yeah. instrumentation and everything. Um, so I, I guess for the first time, I took this thing by its horns and I said, I will do this music myself mm. you know I'm not gonna feel small that I need to get a producer after and then credit them with all of the work that I've put in I will also um, take credit for my work and I will actively um, work on it and be present and you know you know um, 
be the guide, you know, even when I bring people onto the album. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the song itself, the single, um, it sounds like it's about someone who cares for us to the point of worship. Mm -hmm. So tell me about that figure. Uh, well, I'm not going to mention names. Why don't you want to mention this person's <laughs> no, name? I, I don't want them getting a big head either. <laughs> Do they know that it's about them? No, they oh. don't. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel like we are at a point on the continent where we need eth- empath- empathetic leaders mm. who put the people first who will wash our feet, mm. who don't think that we are there to praise them and to hoist, hoist them on our shoulders, but who know that they are the servants of, of the people and who feel that same way about all the people, whether those people voted for them or did not. That once you get to, 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 to that level of leadership, you forget any of that and yeah. you become a servant of the people. I feel like only that kind of love will help us uh, progress. And mm-hmm. in, even in, in our private spaces, um, how we love each other and how you know, we, we take care of each other, we just need more empathy. Yeah. In the world. So this empathetic leader, is he South African? I am not mentioning, (laughs) and I'm not saying anything. (laughs) It could be my friend. Like, it could be my friend. It could be anybody. Okay, it could be me, even. It could be you. Might be me. Mm -hmm. Um, Are we able to talk about a song that they haven't heard yet? Um, Sure, definitely. Just the the album is coming out soon. At the end of this month, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, a song that I feel like should be longer. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's called Zabalaza. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell us about that song. Um, it's a doi doi song. It meets orchestra. Um, but it's got two verses more, so why should it be longer than that? And the chorus? Because it's beautiful. <laughs> it needs... um, you know, like, um, doi doi music has, has really carried us. South Africans, you know, um, the music of the struggle really gave us heart during like the darkest times in our history. Yeah. And I like to reference it um, in my music. And I know that people identify with that kind of music like this. Um, it, it resonates and it, um, it awakens things um, in people and a sense of uh, patriotism. Yeah. And, 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 and pride. Um, it feels like a call to arms, but like in a very chill way. Because I'm chilled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yes. For me, we can never um, forget the, the sacrifices that, that have gotten us to where we are today. Uh, yeah. And I mean, I hope I never have to go to jail for, you know, struggle. Yeah. <laughs> because that was done already. But it is for us to remember and appreciate the sacrifices that got us to where we are today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much for sharing. I am going to, um, before we wrap up, just take maybe five more questions at the very most. So if your question is about, like, did we live in the same neighborhood Please, <laughs> let's not ask those questions. And if you've asked a question already, can we give priority to somebody who hasn't asked a question? <laughs> but my question is, how do you continue to make the music that you want without feeling pressure from the audience to make what you maybe made 15 years ago? So how do you keep on saying, this is what I want to do right now, this is where I'm standing and I'm going to make it without thinking these people want to hear this right now. So yeah. how do you not get that, let that pressure get to you? Um, well, you, you know, I sometimes refer to myself as um, um, and I refer to myself as that because I'm the kind of artist who has their pulse on, on, on the nation kind of thing. Right. I mean, I'm an observer of the times and then I either critique it or I dissect it so that we all know where we are right now and what needs to be done. And therefore, I'm really grateful that I get to spend so much time by myself and just judging you guys. 
<laughs> and then writing songs about you. Um, I I believe that um, there's a part of art that should focus on that, and therefore, um, perhaps that is why my music continues to be relevant because it 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 talks about today, right now, it dissects right now mm. what you're going through right now. And I must say that we were becoming more and more woke by the day, which is really lovely to see. Even though like now people want to use woke as some sort of insult, it's yeah. not. It's not at all. And and it's something beautiful um, for art for artists like me to see. Nice. We had a question at the back there. Um, hello everyone. I would just love to say that I'm honored to be in the same room as you, Simpiwe. So besides, apart from everything that you've said, I want to understand what challenges did you have to go through inside the music industry and outside the music industry until you reached your prime and became a world-renowned artist or singer? So maybe what's the biggest challenge? Because yeah, like Maybe one memorable challenge that you had to go through inside the industry and one memorable challenge that you had to go through outside the industry. Uh, well, inside the industry is being undermined for being a woman, really. Like, I, I, I think for me that has been the, the greatest challenge. Um, and like being able to continue to believe in yourself and your vision and your mission um, when everyone is trying to pull you down mm. or think for you and tell you like, who you are and who you shouldn't be. I remember when I first started in the industry, this other exec was like, you won't last in this industry. You must humble yourself. We've been like, we know this game. We've been around for so long. You should listen to us. Wow. And that time he was not listening to me. I'm like, no, but I do listen to you when you talk about things that you know mm. about. But you cannot tell me about my brand and, and who I, I am and how I should write music. You should listen to me the same way that I listen to you. And had I been a man, you actually would not even be approaching me like this. Yeah. Um, so I, like, there was a lot of that. And I got the name Diva. And who is a diva? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I remember also this one time I was invited to perform at a live show, like a live TV uh, show. Yeah. And I told them, okay, guys, I don't do backtracks. I don't do this. And here's my um, um, technical rider. This is what you will need to get for me to come and perform. Yeah. They agree. And I get there, there's a microphone and a speaker. Mm. <laughs> like, and we're going live in about two hours, right? And even though I found that I didn't storm off. Yeah. I said, okay, let's find a way to make it work. I made a few calls to my friends, but please can you bring me equipment? Right? But it was too short notice and my yeah. friends tried. And in the end, I was like, mm -mm, this is going to be bad for my brand. I've tried, guys. Like, you guys didn't even try. Like, you had all of the information. You didn't even try. And I cannot go on stage. Like, this is bad for my brand. Yeah. So now, even though they had already announced me, like, the people had seen me doing the sound check, mm. I said, no, I'm sorry, guys. I'm not going to continue. These guys went online. I was like, who the hell does she think she is? I will Asha, they come here and sing on back tracks. Who does she? And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, I don't understand this because we agreed yeah. and you said yes but now you, you wanted to just blackmail me into doing something that I told you I'm not comfortable doing yeah. by not honoring our contract at all and now I'm the one who's in the wrong like this, this, this guy we're, we're fuming mm. you know some people must humble yourself and I was like yo I ain't got that guys this is so unfair because you could also see that I tried yeah right? and you didn't have to try in the first place I didn't have, have just, to I didn't have to try but I always tried I yeah. always try, but um, for me, the quality of my work is very, very important. Yeah. And I'm not going to compromise the work and also, um, um, you know, be bad to my fans, you know, by, by giving them some power work just to please an exec who didn't care, you know, about my work ethic and what we had ag agreed upon. So I've had a lot of these where people like they want to insist that it's either their way or their highway, even after like they had promised. And then yeah, like lots of, of bad mouthing. And I know for a fact 
this doesn't happen to men. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't happen to men, but it happens a lot to women. And then we get labeled all yeah. sorts of names for knowing um, our our worth. Yeah. Uh, we have another question. Oh. Hi, Sampua. Hi, sis. Um, I just want to ask you, your music is very lyric rich. There's a whole lot of content and it's very, it's arranged, not in, it's simple, but it's complicated in arrangement. Do you ever get shocked that every single concert, because I've been to 99.9% of you. all <laughs> your experiences, do you get, do you get um, awestruck that most of the time everybody sings along to every single lyric to every single song? I do. I remember I had this show at the baseline. I literally could not even hear myself sing because really? everyone was singing louder than me. Like to, along to all the songs, I was like, "Hey guys, this is my show. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let me sing." Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's truly beautiful. Like, and the reason why I call like those kinds of shows church because people come spiritually ready to to be like a part of this experience. Yeah, that you know, it 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 feels like it, I remember this one time. I actually felt I was having an out of body experience because I could see myself sing that, but. I could see everyone and I was like hang on what's going on here wow. people were screaming I'm like guys what is wrong with you are you possessed <laughs> like, <laughs> like what well, it's, 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 it's truly beautiful for me to see um, because people really come to just um, let it out mm. um, and then let it go and leave it on that flow and go home feeling much lighter yeah that's mm. powerful you have a question um, hi Simpu hi Put. Um, I just wanted to ask, throughout um, your career, how did you balance um, family life and your career, um, especially as a mom and a female? How is it versus us as men uh, being a family? And for you, how was the whole experience in balancing your career and family? I'm not balancing, but I'm a single parent. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard. And, it could, and then it goes back again to the whole Pacheco thing. And men would never be asked that question. How do you balance <laughs> family and life? <laughs> um, but yes, I'm a single parent. I've been a single parent since my son was two months old. He's now turning 15 this year. And it's, it, I thought it would get easier. But you're right, guys. It's, get, it's getting tougher and tougher. I can't wait for them to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Go to varsity or something. You know, and I can be a spring chicken again. <laughs> okay, one last question. If it's a woman, that'll be great. Uh, no ladies? <laughs> no? Oh, the girls, them. I tried. Okay, <laughs> we're going to... No, we're going to take that last question over there. Hi, Simpiwe. Hi, Buti. Awesome. Um, so more than having a question, I think I've got a comment, uh, particularly on, on, on your ability to, to interpret, you know, the struggles of today, us as young people, being that one person that is a representative of our concerns today, you know, um, um, the song Chibok, especially for me, particularly um, encapsulates, um, you know, your ability to, 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 to use the things that happen today, the struggles of today, the events that are happening now, what we're concerned about now, and, and portraying that in a very, very beautiful way. Um, so yeah, I'd like to really commend you for that and thank you for that and you know, being that shining light, being that voice for us as young people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. And on that note, um, so on Imbali Live, we love to Give our guests their flowers while they can still smell them, quite literally. I love that. So, <laughs> thank I you love that. very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate this. Thank you. So I wanted to just say thank you very much for continuing to push the envelope as an artist. Thank you for continuing to push the envelope as a self-care activist. <laughs> Um, and I hope that you feel the love even when you're not sleeping, even when insomnia is kicking your ass. Yeah, it's kicking my ass right now. <laughs> so thank you very much for all that you are and all that you do. Thank you, Sissy. Can we give thank it up? You guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>